everybody, my name is Jordan Burke. I'm the uh, founder and co-owner of SNS Barbell, and this is SNS, SNS University. SNS University is a series of lectures and a series of semesters, the first of which is right now, uh, that goes over everything you need to know about powerlifting, from the theoretical, which is what we're going to dig into today, to technique stuff like bracing and specifics about issues in the squat bench or deadlift, all the way to psychology and the, the mental aspects of training and competition. Um, we're going to have a bunch of guest lectures, which is really cool. A lot of them are going to be anchored by our coaches, uh, Shane, Jacob, Joe, Tommy. Um, the first one is mechanical principles of squat bench and deadlift because this is kind of the foundation of all of our training decisions in powerlifting, um, from how we kind of view your technique to how we think through your lifting when we see it in person. So without further ado, I'm going to jump right in uh, and show you guys some of the mechanical principles. So, the first, the first concept we're going to dig into is force vectors. Um, and that's just because if you can think in force vectors, it'll help you in general in thinking through your own technique um, in a pretty big way. Uh, a force vector is a represent, representation of force that encompasses both magnitude and direction. So, if I'm talking about a force vector, implicit in my uh, kind of wording is the fact that there's a direction implied as well as a magnitude. So if you're squatting, let's say you're squatting 500 pounds, you're squatting that upward. So you're applying force in the squat upward of about 500 pounds, right? So there's a few, uh, a few um, concepts within force vectors that I'm gonna go over. Uh, actually, before I do that, uh, let's talk about what's on the right here. Um, this is a free body diagram. And a free body diagram is something that takes a while in engineering school to wrap your head around, so I'm not really going to teach it in its entirety, but this is just a visual representation of all the forces that are at play, and I'll dig into them a little bit as we go forward. So one concept that's really useful in the world of free body diagrams is the normal force. So the normal force is this really kind of abstract concept that says, if I'm standing here on the ground, I weigh about 180 pounds. That 180 pounds is pointing downward right? Because I'm on the ground. Well, if there was no opposing upward force, then I would theoretically fall through the ground. So the normal force is a theoretical kind of evening out of physics. So technically, if I was to draw a free body diagram of all the forces at play right now in my body, out of 180 pounds pointing downward and 180 pounds of normal force pointing upward. The reason why that's applicable in training is because if you're on a bench, I have 180 pounds pushing downward on the bench, through my body, and on, through the floor, through my feet, plus when I unrack, whatever weight's on the bar, right? So that normal force changes and kind of cancels out all the forces at play. Some people misunderstand this, and they say that the heavier you are, the greater the upward normal force, therefore the more force you can put into a bench press. That's incorrect. Just because you're heavy does not mean you could bench more. Heavier people usually have more muscle mass, but that's kind of different. That's an entirely different topic. Um, so this diagram on the right shows just a general uh, diagram of the forces at play. Bar weight pointing down, lifter weight pointing down, uh, normal force pointing up. And here's on the left an actual kind of simplified free body diagram without the kind of creepy skeleton muscle person. Another important thing to talk about in force vectors is moment arms. And you're hearing a lot about moment arms probably on YouTube, probably from a lot of people who didn't get a exercise science or engineering or physical therapy education. Um, and so a lot of this stuff is usually misunderstood or misapplied, right? So the simplest way to think about a force uh, vector, or, or I'm sorry, a moment arm, is the classic uh, example of your bicep and your arm. And in fact, that's where the term moment arm comes from. It's because a very simple um, visualization of that is the arm. So I have that on the board over here, so let me go over to the board. We have two elbows and two bicep muscles. And ignore my poor drawing skills and pretend these bicep muscles are the same exact size. So you have the humerus, the radius, and the ulna, and then you have your elbow joint right here. The elbow joint, this dot here, represents the fulcrum of your lever arm. If the bicep could, 
it would pull the radius and the ulna in its entirety straight up. That's all this thing does, is pull up. The only reason your arm curves around your bicep, and in effect creates a moment arm around the elbow, is because this spot at the bottom of the humerus keeps the base of the radius and ulna from going up, okay? So now we have this nice moment arm rotation going on. You'll see here, the center of, uh, the, the, where the force is applied, the force vector comes from the center of the bicep, the center of where the force is applied in the bicep. And on the left, you have a greater distance, let's say this is four centimeters. And let's say this one is two centimeters. You have a greater distance on this bicep than on this bicep. So the moment arm over here will be stronger because it's literally the force of the bicep pulling up multiplied by this distance here. The math works out to this system being twice as forceful as this system. That's cool and everything. Don't take this, or I should say take this with a grain of salt because there's a lot of variables involved. Usually you're not going to see a difference this large between people, two centimeters or four, four centimeters. So you're not going to have somebody twice as strong with the same identical looking arm with the same bicep strength. Um, you could, there's a lot of people in this world, but a lot of variables are at play here. This person could have a bicep three times as strong and therefore lift more weight, right? Um, so this is a concept to, to be applied in general in thinking. Again, kind of a theoretical idea that you can think of in your training. This applies in really interesting ways in technique because you can actually modify, this is a kind of a genetic trait here, but you can modify your moment arms by essentially tucking your elbows more or less in the bench. And we can get into that stuff in a later seminar about the bench in particular. Okay. Um, so, another concept in force vectors that's pretty important and pretty applicable in powerlifting is the resultant force. So the resultant force is this blue line here. And essentially what it is, is it's a force vector that represents both an X component and a Y component. Because in reality, no force that you ever apply is going to be directly upward. Usually up is a Z component, but for this picture here, this two-dimensional creepy spooky skeleton guy, um, up is gonna be Y. So you're never really applying a force, uh, a force vector directly up. There's always gonna be some X component. Same thing in the X. You're never applying a force directly in the X component. There's always gonna be a little bit of Y. There will always be a resultant force and that's the one you have to think about. So for a two-dimensional person here, the bench is a great example of this. Leg drive. And leg drive is a complex topic. Again, we'll get, that, get into that in a future SNSU video. But always think of leg drive as a resultant force. You're going to have a Y um, component because you're pressing down with your feet. You will literally never have zero Y component because if you had zero Y component, your feet would slide off the ground, right? It would just slide straight down, uh, which would be no useful, uh, would, would not be useful for bench. Um, and there's also an X component, which is the one we kind of care about more. Um, and that's going to be related to the amount of friction you could find between your feet and the ground and how hard you push your butt towards your head when you bench and create that nice tight arch. That resultant force, we want it to be, this is not a very good one, I just drew it here because that's how this skeleton person is benching, not very good form. We want it to be closer to here, right? We want our resultant force to be like this, if possible. That way we can really get our arch nice and tight by pressing our body this way, okay? And the resultant force, again, applies in everything that you do. In the squat, you're not just pressing up Right? Or you're, not, you're not applying force directly up in the squat. Even though we want the bar to go directly up, all we can ever do is strive for a 100% Y component. We're never really going to get there. That's one of the reasons why powerlifting is so wonderful. So that's it for force vectors. I just taught you, you know, year one of mechanical engineering in about five minutes. So if it's confusing, I apologize. Um, there's a lot more to it. Uh, and we'll probably do a little bit more uh, in regard to force vectors in a later series. Um, the next big topic 
in kind of the mechanical principles is center of mass. So center of mass, center of gravity, center of balance, these can more or less be used interchangeably. And there's a lot of people who try to kind of nitpick between them. Um, in engineering, they're used essentially as the same term. Um, center of gravity or center of mass is the center of the volume of mass that your body takes up. If you were to homogenize the mass in your body, like, you know, uh, muscle weighs more than fat, bones have a certain amount of density, different bones in your body have different density than others. But if you were to just say, 100% of my body is the same density, center of mass would be the center of my volume, okay? That's kind of complex. If I was a perfect rectangle, then, and I was homogeneously um, uh, dense, then my center of mass would be directly in the center of me. But it's not, it's somewhere above or below, probably pretty high because your torso has a lot more of your mass than your legs. So your center of mass is gonna be not in the middle of your torso, but somewhere closer to maybe your, your hips, a little bit above the hips, maybe around kind of the stomach area. Um, now, that plays into almost everything in your powerlifting technique, okay? Your center of mass or your center of balance, if it's shifted out of your center of pressure, then you're gonna have a lot of problems. And I'll explain that by, and you can see down here, center of mass up here, center of pressure, right? Um, these things are always related to each other, and I'll explain that in the next slide. Oh, I gotta go back. Oh, no I don't. So, here's a couple um, kind of images, a couple of visuals explaining center of pressure. So, you'll see on the right, there's kind of a topology involved here. Um, and that's because you don't apply pressure evenly throughout your foot. On the left, you see kind of red regions, which is more force, blue regions, which is less force. Um, there's some really cool products out there that can map your center of pressure through your foot. Um, and on the right, you can see that magnitude of that pressure, right, in this topology graph. Uh, if I take you to the blackboard, I'll show you a little bit more about this. So, you'll see two feet. Again, excuse my poor drawing skills. These feet should be identical for the purpose of this. Not everybody's feet are identical. Um, one foot could have an issue, one foot could be longer than the other. Um, but for this purpose, the feet are identical. You'll see different uh, kind of pressure areas in these feet. So let's say the center of pressure in the left foot is more towards the ball of the foot. The center of pressure in this right foot is more towards the heel, right? And so you could draw a line And then right here would be the center of pressure of the entire system. So this can change based on how you apply your center of balance during your lifting. So what I mean by that is, here's a good example. Get into a squat position, right? I'm gonna do kind of a quarter squat. Uh, I apologize for that, but I wanna stay in frame. So get into a squat position and just move your center of mass around kind of in a circle, and feel your feet, right? You might feel your heels coming up, right? You might feel your toes coming up, but you should feel it all moving from the front of your foot to the back of your foot, right? Back right, front right, front left, back left. You could do that while you're squatting. And in fact, a lot of the time I see poor bar path, it's not because of any specific technique thing, it's just a simple shift in your center of mass, your center of pressure, can get your bar path to look Beautiful. Uh, so, some of the key takeaways here. Uh, let me go to the next slide. Let me go to the next slide. Um, center of balance is not necessarily midfoot. And this is a big one. A lot of people get confused by this. And there's a lot of really big um, resources out there, really well known resources that kind of goof this one up royally. Um, let me give you a good example of how this is true. Uh, the center of balance of your body, again, center of balance, center of mass, somewhere around my belly button, not in the front of me, somewhere in the middle of me. Um, that is always going to be, if I'm standing up straight, a little closer to my heels than my toes, right? If I have really big feet, it doesn't necessarily mean I'm gonna stand like this, right? But the center of pressure should be in the middle of your foot, roughly, right? 
the further away from your heel it is, the more calf muscle you're going to have to use for stabilization. The further towards the heel it is, the less toe and ball of your foot you're going to use for balance. So it's somewhere towards the middle of the foot. The longer your foot is, let's say you have a foot that's 10 feet long, right? Obviously not how humans have evolved, but just think about that in your head. A person that's roughly my height, 5 foot 10, 6 foot, um, with a foot 10 foot long, right? My center of pressure will likely not be all the way five foot in front of me. It'll be somewhere closer, not necessarily midfoot. My center of balance will definitely not be way out there five feet in front of me. I'm a little less than six foot tall, right? My center of balance is going to be close to my heel. So that is kind of a simple way to wrap your head around the fact that center of balance is not necessarily midfoot. So when you're thinking about your technique, especially in the deadlift, don't worry so much about midfoot, okay? Kind of detach midfoot from your definition of a good deadlift. Midfoot is a good tool to use for setting up, right? But don't get married to that. It's not that important. Another important tool in analyzing center of mass and center of balance um, is the apparent length. So the apparent length is a term borrowed from aerospace. Right? So the apparent surface area of a wing of an airplane is, you know what, this marker's failing me. Here's my backup. This is a poorly drawn airfoil. So the apparent surface area of an airfoil to get lift, right, is here to here, right? This is the apparent length, and that's used to calculate lift of an aircraft, okay? So that term can be used in powerlifting, let's say in a sumo deadlift, right? So if your feet are pointed straight forward, let's say for the conventional deadlift, Usually you don't see people with a ton of balance issues in the conventional deadlift because you can use your entire foot for balance. In sumo, the wider your stance is and the more aggressive your toe angle is, the shorter the apparent length of your foot is. So if we wanted to, for some reason, calculate your balance, right, you might tip a little more forward or a little further backward the wider your toe angle is and you're going to have a harder time locking out that sumo pull. And that's because the wider the toe angle, the less apparent length, the harder it is to balance. So if you're having balance issues and you have a really aggressive toe angle, try bringing that toe angle in. It's not necessarily something that you say to every lifter. It's kind of a more advanced technique to bring that toe angle out. There are benefits. A wider toe angle means you can have your hips wider, you can get closer to the bar. Um, but that's a technique for, for an advanced lifter, somebody who can master that really difficult balance. Um, if you're having trouble, back off and work towards that more aggressive toe angle over time. And again, we'll dig more into that into, in our um, specific deadlift seminar. This one could be an entire lecture in itself, and I believe it will be. Um, force velocity curves are something that I've paid a lot of attention um, and I've thought about a lot. Uh, mostly because I didn't say this in my intro, but I'm also the founder of Rep One Strength, and we build velocity-based training tools. Um, so these charts are incredibly valuable to learn and to understand, to apply, not, not even just apply velocity-based training, but to think about your own lifts in terms of speed and force. So the chart on the left, this one here, uh, on the x-axis, the greater the velocity on the y-axis, you'll see the force decrease. So velocity, as we go to the right, the velocity increases, you'll see applied force decrease. And there's a simple reason for that. If I have 135 pounds on the bar and I'm standing on a force plate, I'm going to move that really fast. The force plate's not going to measure much force because I can only expend enough force to get that bar up. And by the time that bar moves, uh, my force dissipates and I'm already done locking out. Right? So let's, let's um, contrast that with me trying to squat 
a bar that's welded on either side, right? I'm gonna press as hard as I can and that thing's not gonna move, so I'm gonna get an opportunity. I'm gonna have the time to apply all the force that I can. And so a force plate, if it were underneath me, would show essentially my one rep max. So let's think about, on this chart, the maximal strength area. So you'll notice it's kind of asymptotic here. This is what we, we would call your 1RM velocity, your velocity at 1RM. And it's this kind of elusive number. It's, it's almost a theoretical number um, because you'll never quite nail that 1RM. You might see somebody at a powerlifting competition, they'll do a 10 second squat. And you might look at that and say, oh man, that's their velocity at 1RM max. But it's not because it's a theoretical number at zero velocity, right? Um, or the 1RM is a theoretical number at zero velocity, right? The velocity at 1RM is the theoretical number at your absolute peak load. Um, so maximal strength all the way over here. And our job in powerlifting is to get as close to this as possible. So if we could use whatever tools we have at our disposal to measure or to estimate velocity at 1RM max, you could see how that could be a really powerful tool for us to use to pick attempts to get somebody to that 1RM, to that true 1RM. Um, on the right, also, before I go to the graph on the right, take this with a grain of salt. So this is a very old concept, this force velocity curve in these force velocity zones. It's antiquated. Um, it's useful in theory, but there, there, there is no such thing as a speed strength zone or a power zone. Um, or a strength speed zone. These zones don't exist. The reason why is because the traditional thought behind that speed or strength speed somewhere between 0.3 and 0.5 meters per second. My 0.3 to 0.5 is very different than Tommy's 0.3 to 0.5 or Joe's 0.3 to 0.5 or Halson's 0.3 to 0.5. And that's because we're all different heights. We all have different training ages. There's a ton of variables involved. So what the industry has moved towards and what Rep1 is putting a lot of work behind is individualized load velocity correlations. And so my 1RM velocity is gonna be different than everybody else's, so this chart is gonna to look totally different because it goes asymptotic here in a totally different spot. So if that's confusing, again, I apologize. This is a huge topic and we'll go over more in the future. Um, now this chart on the right is really cool. One of the most complex things to wrap your mind around really mind-bending, but if you could put the time in and really try to understand this, it'll be very useful. I actually have a example drawn on the board right here. Cool, so this is an acceleration curve uh, for the squat. And it's in kind of an exaggerated one so I can have space to draw, but this is so useful to wrap your head around that this has been up in the gym for years. Um, so this chart is acceleration this, your x-axis, is time. At time zero, our acceleration is zero. We're just standing straight, right? We don't have positive acceleration. We're not accelerating up. We don't have downward acceleration. We're not accelerating down. We're standing still. In the squat, you start accelerating downward. So your acceleration is increasing in the downward direction until you hit your peak downward acceleration, which is somewhere as you're going down in the squat. Now, you'll notice this line starts going back up to zero, and that's because you are decelerating to zero acceleration, which is at the bottom position, okay? So accelerating down until you get your peak acceleration, decelerating to the bottom position, and then you bounce up. You'll see this is a pretty steep curve. You accelerate upward during the squat until you reach peak acceleration. Peak acceleration is somewhere before peak velocity. That sounds kind of counterintuitive, but the reason why is because around here you still have positive acceleration, so you're still increasing in velocity. It has some peaks and valleys here because if you're doing a squat, you have all this biomechanical action going on, all these moment arms, all these lever arms, and then eventually you'll level out, you'll decelerate as you go to locking out, and you'll go to a standstill, which is zero acceleration. Probably pretty complicated, but this is how you would look at a squat in a pure physics approach. Cool. So 
That, on this right side here, is our black line. And the simplest line on this graph is our displacement line, because that's the one that you probably are most familiar with. In a squat, your displacement on the way down, by the way, this is not a squat. This is a, um, what's called a ramp function. But your displacement on a squat, you have displacement downward. Let's say this is zero. Your displacement is negative some millimeters until you reach the bottom. My range of motion is usually around 600-ish. So at the bottom, I'd be at 600 millimeters, negative 600. Then I'd go up, and then my displacement would change over time until I get to roughly zero again. So you look at the step function, and you see, okay, well, somebody went from zero, this is in meters, zero meters of displacement to around 0.2, maybe 250 millimeters of displacement. Then they leveled out, okay? So you can think about this as somebody walking up one step of stairs. Your velocity goes from zero, obviously at zero displacement, your velocity increases as you walk up that step of stairs. It peaks somewhere around the middle of your step because you have to slow down to come to a stop at that stair. So I don't want to have to teach calculus to people for this graph. That would be absolutely ridiculous. But in calculus, you can actually do math. The peak here is exactly related to the highest rate of change, which is the steepest slope in your displacement. Now, let's go one step beyond, right? The derivative of velocity is acceleration. The same thing applies here. The steepest curve in your velocity is where the peak in acceleration will be. So you have a steep curve here, right? It inverts. Where it inverts, it crosses zero. You have a steep curve here, Again, right there will correlate with another peak down there. And then it'll keep doing all this kind of wild, complex, dynamic stuff down here. So this is, again, just for walking up a step of stairs. The reason why this is important in powerlifting, if I can bring it back home, is because let's say you want to apply the stretch reflex in a squat. Well, most people, they do it pretty well because your body kind of passively acts as a rubber band, right? It potentiates itself on the way down, right? The tendons in your body and the muscles store elastic energy until you hit the bottom and then you bounce right back up. Well, if you can take advantage of that bounce, if you can ride the accelerative wave upward, right, then we can create the most velocity as we move through the lift. Another interesting thing here, if you ever measure velocity, and I know some people at SNS do measure velocity. You can cheat your velocities by, let's say, delaying that accelerative peak by pushing really hard and then jumping off the ground, right? The heavier the weight gets, the harder it is to do that, which is why at a one rep max, you can't really cheat that. But if you can apply more force than the load on the bar, let's say I'm squatting 300 pounds and I apply 350 pounds of force, right? I can pop that bar off my back. Pretty simple math, right? The bar can get off my back because I applied more force than the weight of the bar. So you can cheat your velocities and therefore cheat yourself and cheat your coach if at the top of the squat you pop your knees really hard, your ankles come off the ground, the bar comes off your back, and then it settles. So in velocity-based training, one of the most important concepts is maximal intent for speed. But we want maximal intent for speed without cheating. We're getting towards the end of this, so if you're getting a little tired, don't worry. Um, this is one of my favorites. Inertia, one of the biggest mechanical concepts, not just in lifting, but in life. Um, an interesting anecdote, well, an interesting kind of analogy is if you've ever heard, um, if you're a bug, a little tiny insect, gravity is a lot less important to you than surface tension, right? As humans, the scale that we exist, gravity is very important. If I jump 
gravity's gonna push me down to the ground. If I jump into a pool, gravity's gonna push me down to the bottom of that pool. But if you're a bug, and you have very little mass, if you jump onto a body of water, you don't sink. Because surface tension, as a force, has greater impact in your life. What's fascinating about inertia is we can experience, let's say with a barbell, essentially no impact of inertia on our lives, right? When you squat, you can do, you can break a lot of rules in powerlifting. You can do a total good morning. Your center of balance can be beyond your toes with just an empty barbell, and you'll get that bar up because inertia isn't that big of a deal yet. But we can experience a full gamut of inertia's impact on our lives by going from that small amount of mass to a very large amount of mass. Again, relative, but the heavier you get, the reason I have a picture of Ray Williams here is because Ray Williams squats the most weight out of anybody. So if you were to ask him, I'm sure he'd tell you inertia is very important to him. As he puts nearly 1,100 pounds on his back, that barbell is going to tell him where he's going to go. All he can do is make a suggestion. Hey, I would like to go up in a straight line. Um, I don't want to bail forward or backward. Um, so I hope you comply, right? That's the imaginary conversation I think Ray Williams has with a barbell. So what he experiences, if he messes up at all, and you can see Ray Williams has lifts where, I mean, by his attempts, he should have nailed that lift, but the weight just, gets, just buries him, right? Or it kind of flies off his back or it dips him way forward. He goes down with that weight. He hits the bottom. His stretch reflex is absolutely remarkable. If he doesn't nail the groove just right, and he implies, he, he imparts force not directly upward, but his resultant force vector is a little bit forward, that's it. End of story. Inertia states that an object with mass wants to keep going in the direction it was last imparted force. It wants to go in a straight line. If you want to deviate from that straight line, you have to impart force in the opposite direction. So, if Ray Williams is squatting, and he implies, imparts force this way, and he has 1,100, nearly 1,100 pounds on his back, that bar really wants to go this way. To get it back, he has to take 1,100 pounds and apply force in the X component, right? Or some resultant force, majority X component, to get back over a center of balance before he can press it up again, or squat it up again. So, although you're, none of you are Ray Williams, except for maybe one of you, hopefully, um, then inertia is not going to play that big of a role in your lifting, but it does play a role. And I'm sure every single one of you in a squat hit the bottom, misgrooved it, and then maybe took a step forward. Or maybe it was way harder than you thought it was. That's because inertia doesn't like changing, right? Um, it wants to go in that, that direction that it's first imparted force. And if you want to change that, you have to impart more force. That's one of the main reasons why technique is so important. Um, the most efficient lifters have honed their technique over time so that, again, going back to resultant force, they're only applying force in that one direction that it needs to go, which is always up. Uh, and that's when you see those really beautiful straight bar paths, really efficient lifts, really clean load velocity curves uh, and force velocity curves. So we have an example, um, and I'm going to load this example up separately. It'll be in this um, seminar. We'll also post it on social media. Um, it's a cable pulley example just to show you how important inertia is uh, in our day-to-day -day lives and really to kind of drive home what inertia is. This is one of the last examples. This one's kind of complex. Um, it comes straight out of dynamic systems lectures um, and kind of vibrations lectures that you would get in an engineering degree. Um, it's called uh, springs and dampers. So the best way to explain this is the wrist. So the wrist joint has several springs, technically, and dampers in it that change the dynamics of the bench press. So what do I mean by springs and dampers? A spring is something that you can load that will push back, okay? So in the wrist, if I push my wrist down, it really doesn't want to be there. There's like an inherent spring in my wrist 
that wants to push back up. There's also dampers involved, right? The, the wrist joint itself, some of the flesh here, okay? Um, if I'm wearing wrist wraps, the wrist acts as a damper pushing against the spring of my wrist. And what this creates is a dynamic system, a dynamic system that has some sort of vibration or oscillation, right? And you might see somebody, we actually have a video of this um, from a lifter who, who failed a, um, a bench press in a gym. Sometimes you can actually hit a resonance in your bench and your wrist kind of wobble like that and it'll drop the bar, right? Or your wrist will wobble and you'll recover, but you'll be like, wow, what the hell was that? That's because the springs and dampers are fighting against each other. Usually that results in um, what's called um, kind of like a homeostasis, right? Where everything is kind of in perfect harmony. So you'll, you know, what, how does that apply to what we're doing? Well, we wear wrist wraps so that way we can protect the wrist as the wrist is bent back. And it also kind of uh, um, balances out that spring. The heavier the weight gets, you'll, you'll see a lot of geared lifters put the bar higher up in their hand. Part of that is because they want the wrist to bend back so they can maybe have a lower touching point or so they can tuck their elbows more and use more of their bench shirt while keeping the bar high up on the wrist so they can have kind of a higher touch point. Um, the lighter your bench press is, the sad reality is, you need that bar directly over the base of your wrist. And that actually is so true, it's so pervasive, that fact, that for most benchers, even really, really good benchers, we want the bar over the base of the wrist, right over the upper arm, okay? We want to avoid that spring damper kind of dynamic system of the palm and of the hand and avoid getting the bar too high up. Um, there's also some other dynamics behind that, and we'll get into that when we get into the bench lecture. Um, but springs and dampers are in everything that we do. Um, again, the stretch reflex is one of the big ones. Um, mass itself is a damper. And you can see that if you ever do any for, uh, further research on this. Um, so that the heavier the mass is, the more a system is dampened. Um, and um, yeah, and springs are, you know, a, there's a lot of springs inherent in a lift. Your Achilles tendon is one of the biggest springs in your body, right? Because it's one of the strongest tendons, one of the stiffest tendons in your body. And that's why you, uh, uh, um, you can jump high, is because you load, right? Um, you do like a counter movement in your jump, you load that Achilles tendon, you load that, that kind of um, spring system, and then you launch yourself up. Uh, so again, this is kind of, uh, has a lot to do with, with how we think through lifts in general. And the last concept we're going to talk about, it's not really an overarching concept, an overarching mechanical principle, but it's so important in powerlifting that it's kind of worthy of its own slide. Um, rigidity or tightness. Um, tightness is something that you should be thinking about constantly. And that's because we want you to be rigid in your lifts. So the easiest way to explain this is the squat. So, if I'm doing a squat and I'm bracing, I want to take a big breath and I want to brace my core, okay? And what I'm doing here is I'm making everything here as rigid as possible. So what I don't want, I don't want when I'm lifting um, extension or flexion of the spine. I want everything from the hips up to be like a solid brick. And that's because any force that I apply comes from below my hips. So again, we're talking about force vectors. I want to apply a force vector directly up, but I lean forward, right? I lean forward and hopefully keep the barbell, which is likely going to be right around my center of mass, directly over the center of mass of my body, my center of balance. And so I want to keep this thing so tight that when I do that, I have it under control. I don't introduce extra dynamics by arching my back and then having to compensate by moving that center of balance forward by shifting my hips like this, right? Or the opposite. I don't want to come down and then round my back, right? Bring my center of mass forward again that way, and then have to compensate. I want everything to be rigid, so that way 
My squad is a mirror image on the way down and on the way up. Nothing, again, nothing from the hips up is imparting force upward on the barbell. So get that out of the equation, make it super tight, super rigid, and you won't have these issues that I was talking about. And that applies in everything. It applies in bench, it applies in deadlift. It applies in your tricep pushdowns, right? Try a tricep pushdown and don't flex your abs at all, right? It's impossible because you want a strong core, a stiff core, so you can really isolate those triceps, okay? It has everything to do with lifting. So this diagram here is a really useful diagram because it kind of bends this beam and shows compression on the top, tension on the bottom. Same thing in the squat. You want to take your big breath, compression in the front, tension in the back. Some people do the opposite. They do tension in the back. Uh, I'm sorry, compression in the back, tension in the front. Uh, those people are few and far between. A lot of them are genetically gifted in the deadlift particularly. So you see a lot of deadlift monsters getting away with a squat like this. For the rest of us mortals, we want to stick with the kind of foundational concept, a foundational rule in the squat, which is big breath, brace that core, right? Keep the front of your body in compression. And then you want to keep your back tight, right? And you can add a little bit of compression in your back by pulling down on the bar. We'll get more into that in the bracing seminar. But in general, you want your core compressed, you want your core tight, you want to, and that'll generate more rigidity in your torso. So I believe this is our last slide. That is our last slide. Hey, this is Jordan. That was SNSU Semester 1, Episode 1. Uh, thank you all for watching. If you like that, if you have any questions, please add some comments below. Uh, feel free to subscribe. Get our course content online, snsbarbell.com. If you want to talk to any one of our coaches, you can go to our gyms, one in Williamsburg, one in Bushwick, SNS Barbell, and I'll talk to you guys soon.